Good morning, it's three minutes after ten and you are listening to LBC. Probably the wisest decision you will make all day. Quite a lot to get through today. I have a bit of a yen. It's up to you, obviously, as always. The uh, uh, Paul McCartney has weighed in on the subject of the Rolling Stones, I think for the first time in decades. And it's almost like a great weight has been lifted from my shoulders because now that Paul McCartney himself has uh, validated the opinion that I've always held, I find myself thinking that I might pluck up the courage to share that opinion in public. But we shall see. There are obviously much more important matters in front of us, um, some of which you probably won't be reading in your newspaper this morning, depending upon whether you, A, take a newspaper and, B, which newspaper you take. But the inflation worries and job vacancies reaching record high uh, combine to create rather... Uh, important uh, worries on the immediate horizon. You'll be aware of the rise in race hate crimes. That seems particularly unpleasant news, doesn't it? Um, Not least because uh, so many foreigners have been sent packing as a result of that vote back in 2016. So how could race hate crimes be rising still? I suppose there's some relief on the horizon because the two minutes of hate seems now to be redirected at unemployed people rather than foreign people. So hopefully we'll see a decline in race hate crimes and an increase in people lamping eco-protesters and uh, being vile about unemployed people instead. Um, Also looking at vaccination levels where the UK has slipped from its lead in in Europe, um, which is a bit of a worry, I, I would argue, particularly as that Uh, is blamed upon a slow uptake in younger groups and also the growing gap between the rich and the poor when it comes to life expectancy. So you can see why I'm drawn towards the conversation about the Beatles and the Rolling Stones at 12. Goodness me, Um, the the, the menu is pretty grim, inevitably. And also, speaking of grim, we have to find ourselves talking once again about Dominic Cummings. Now, listen, come here a minute, because I can understand why you might not want to. Goodness knows, uh, you know, the evidence of, of um, I mean, even that, you know, so hard to choose my words on this conversation. And yet it's such an important conversation to have. Uh, Dominic Cummings has revealed overnight on Twitter that the intention of the government in which he was, of course, an intrinsic part, arguably the most important part, was always to, I need a better word than renege, was always to uh, renege upon the uh, withdrawal agreement, the, so, the, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. I mean, it is, there's so much going on here. The phone lines are open. It's going to be one of those days where I, I'm not sure at five past ten whether I'll have a clear and concise question to ask by quarter past ten, but you'll know enough about what the subject under discussion is um, to, to have a view. And, and I really do not want this to be, um, a, 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 well, you know it isn't. It never is a, an exercise in I told you so or, or anything like that. But I'm afraid it is a matter of record that everybody who understood what was going on knew that the situation in Ireland was going to be unsustainable. When the Good Friday Agreement met the withdrawal from the customs union and the single market, all manner of problems were going to be thrown up. We find ourselves today in the remarkable position of waiting for the European Union to come along and clean up the mess that we've made. And that, again, is not a matter of opinion, really. It's a matter of fact. The the European Commission today will put forward proposals that are designed to safeguard the peace process on the island of Ireland. And it's very hard from where I'm sitting not to conclude that they are prioritising the peace process more than the UK government is. And that is a point which becomes almost impossible to refute when you have a look at what the unelected bureaucrat Dominic Cummings, or the former, the now unemployed unelected bureaucrat Dominic Cummings, has been uh, sharing on social media, essentially uh, dismissing concerns about the Northern Irish priest process uh, and, and admitting that it was always the intention to trash it, to dump it. Leo Varadkar, the former Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland, has expressed alarm at this revelation. Um, I, in normal times, if it wasn't for the stupid binary division that's been drawn right across the middle of our country, this would be huge news. This would be leading every bulletin. It would be on every front page. It is absolutely epic news that the uh, former key advisor to the Prime Minister has admitted that the uh, the deal, the treaty, call it whatever you want to call it, upon which the entire election was won, has been... Um, uh, was always going to be torn up and thrown away. These comments are very alarming, says Leo Varadkar, because that would indicate that this is a government that acted in bad faith, that this is a British government that doesn't necessarily keep its word. These are the words of a former leader of the country 
Is it geographically closer than France? I, 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 no, I think it might be a tiny little bit further away. But linguistically, culturally and historically, Ireland and England, Ireland and Great Britain could not be closer. Um, and you shouldn't make any agreement with them, says Leo Varadka, until such time as you're confident that they keep their promises. And this is huge. This is almost unconscionably huge. Leo Varadka, former leader of Ireland, saying... Thanks to Dominic Cummings letting the cat out of the bag, the British government is not one that we can ever trust until we're confident that they will keep their promises. These comments are very alarming because they would indicate that this is a government that acted in bad faith. This is a British government that doesn't necessarily keep its word, doesn't necessarily honour the agreements that it makes. And David Frost yesterday, of course, was on his feet essentially um, insisting that everybody should do as he says and not do what he agreed they could do. It, it, it's crazy. And here's the weird thing. I think we've been doing this um, long enough together now to have built up a modicum of trust. So I, I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to take no more than two or three minutes just to uh, share some professional problems with you. I don't really want to talk about this. I would love to talk about, I don't know, fireworks and traffic jams or something utterly meaningless or relatively trivial. But this is, uh, this is the subject that has riven our country on a, on a scale that's never before been seen in peacetime. This is the root of almost all the problems that we are currently facing, whether it is fears about you having a turkey at Christmas or ports turning away container ships because there are no lorry drivers to take their contents to the places where they're needed, restaurants, everybody crying out for stuff. This is the root cause of almost all our problems. And to talk about, or, or the main cause, or a main cause, not the only cause, so to talk about the problems without acknowledging where they come from. It's beyond pathetic. It's actually frightening. It's psychotic. And, and the people who queued up to tell you, the politicians, and I, I'm afraid the members of this profession that queued up to tell you, even perhaps in front of this very microphone, that the oven-ready deal would be the answer to all our problems, are now almost silent on the subject of why we're already trying to disown the oven-ready deal and announce to the world that we are a country not to be trusted. And the point at which you go, oh, shut up, O'Brien, wind your neck in, um, is the point at which you have to stick your fingers in your ears and close your eyes because it's Dominic Cummings that is revealing this stuff. Not a continuity remain or, I don't know, um, J.K. Rowling it, 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 or Gary Lineker. It's Dominic Cummings who is revealing that they lied to you when, and they lied to the co-signatories of the treaty. It's, it's a moment of epic historical significance, but so much of the right-wing media is so gaslit and groomed now that they can't even admit that the sky is blue. It's, it's a moment of absolute madness can't even admit that the sky is blue. So Dominic Cummings is sitting there now, desperately begging to be noticed. He's on, he's on Twitter picking up 40 or 50 likes when, take it from me, you don't have to be uh, a latter-day Oscar Wilde to pick up four or 5,000 for, for pretty much everything you say on there. Uh, desperate, say, please notice me, Dominic Cummings, the, the, the man who drove this juggernaut into the heart of Downing Street, begging to be noticed as he lets out all of the cats from all of the bags, the biggest one of all being today. Yeah, we never intended to, to on. Of course it was never going to work. We knew that. And, and the weird thing is, we did know that. Or at least I did. And anybody listening to this program with at least one ear open and, and half a mind open, and they, you knew this. You knew it was never going to work. It couldn't work. When the Good Friday Agreement met the withdrawal from the Customs Union, something was going to have to give. And yet, I don't know. I'll never understand. Why people chose not to believe it. I know some people didn't understand it. For, for, for the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg, it was an intellectual bridge too far, I think. It, it was an actual failure of intelligence or an absence of intelligence. It, it was as if he'd been given a really sort of, well, not even that difficult. He'd been given a moderately difficult sum to do. And he just picked his favorite number as the answer. And given the nature of our class system and our political system, you, you, you get away with that in the short term. So, you know, you're asked, what, what's the square root of 375? And you say, well, 15. And I mean, an awful lot of people who like you, 
they, they don't know how to do the sum either. So they'll take your 15 and they'll shout it at the top of their little voices. Well, 15! 15! Yes, enjoy those remainder tears. 15 is that... Well, well, right. It's, it's not true. It's a massive failure of intelligence. But it's said with a full chest. It's said with confidence. So that explains some of it. And then that's why Cummings' intervention today is so interesting. Because then there's the other lot who I used to look at and I used to think... <laughs> Either they're lying or they're deranged. Because it's so, once you've got the tools that you need to comprehend this, it's so easy to understand. It's so easy to understand that you cannot have on the island of Ireland two separate regulatory frameworks. You remember the fellow who explained it to us first? Because he'd built an extension on his house since the peace process was signed, since the peace deal was signed, and it meant that his bathroom was in the north and the rest of his house was in the Republic of Ireland. So... The people who didn't understand it, whether for what you would call almost sort of quasi-religious exceptionalist nationalist reasons or through a simple failure of intelligence, for whom Jacob Rees-Mogg is is, is obviously the poster boy, but there are so many of them, Mark Francois, Ian Duncan Smith, Owen Patterson, Brexit Hardman, Steve Baker, all of the ERG, they simply didn't understand it. I mean, Ian Duncan Smith standing up in the House of Commons at the end of last year and saying, oh, oh, I don't think any of us need to actually read this. <laughs> we don't need to read this deal. I think we've been talking about it for quite long enough. We don't need to read this deal. Fast forward six months, ten months now. My God, we can't possibly be held to the terms of this deal. And he still gets invited on the telly to talk about it. And how completely does your flush have to be busted before everybody from the BBC to GBBs decides maybe now you're probably not the person we should go to for your latest insights into an issue that you have demonstrated an absolute failure to grasp even the most basic tenets of? Oh, we don't need to look at this deal. I think we've all talked about it for quite long enough. Let's just sign it, vote for it, and then set off the party poppers. Fast forward six months. My God, we can't possibly be held to the terms of this deal. It's absolutely infernal. So that mystery has now been solved. Were they lying or were they deranged? So take that lot, your Duncan Smiths, your Reese Moggs, your Pattersons, your Francois, your Brexit hardman, Steve Baker, all of that lot, and put them in the box marked not very bright. Bears a very little brain. Didn't understand it, okay? Sadly, most of Fleet Street, I think, perhaps falls into that category as well. And, and in their defence, there's a sort of uh, cultish... Uh, myopia that creeps in. So people who are otherwise intelligent, people who might not be able to give you the square root of that number, but they're quite good at um, trigonometry, you know? They're, they're, so they're not stupid people, but something weird happens when words like sovereignty are introduced into the mix. So we'll leave them over there, either through a lack of intelligence or a weird sort of cultish myopia. They couldn't work out that the sky is blue. And then over on this side, represented by Dominic Cummings, you had the people that you thought, well, they're not thick. They're not as clever as they think they are, but they're not thick. What's going on here? And now we know. They were lying. They never intended to abide by the terms of the deal that got them elected. And I've got two questions for you. I know you, you, you're you not ready yet, and it sometimes feels as if I'm rubbing your face in it, and I'm really sorry about that. But as ever, from the very start of this whole horrible process all i've tried to do is tell you the truth and if you'd believed me if you'd listened to me this time last year you would not be now surprised and or embarrassed by what is happening and what you facilitated all right if i'd encouraged you to to, to vote for this absolute hell escape I'd, I'd probably be um trying to get you across about unemployed people today rather than looking at the single most issue that this country has ever faced in peacetime and the continuing mess that unravels from it so i'm sorry i i, I know and and if you don't want to listen then i'll have to deal with that i have to find ways of keeping you on board without making it feel like i'm rubbing your face in it it was not your fault so much energy money expenditure time was put into persuading people to, to go down that particular road. I will never, apart from the racists, I will never have a problem with people who did. Contempt for the con men, compassion for the con. But Cummings has come out now and said, we never intended to abide by the terms of that deal. And that should be like the Titanic sinking. That the, the man who did more to sell Brexit to this country and to propel Boris Johnson into Downing Street on the back of it is now much ruder about Boris Johnson than I am. Much ruder. And 
absolutely explicit about the fact that that thing that Lord Frost negotiated was always going to be abandoned, betrayed, denied, reneged upon. Now, I, I, I do want to know how that makes you feel. 0345 606973 is the number that you need. Uh, how, how does that make you feel? How does the knowledge now from the man at the center of the power at the time, the Barnard Castle boy himself, how does the fact that he has coughed to what we all knew was the case? He was, they were either lying or deranged, and now we know that they were lying. 03456060973. And how about, what does this say to the rest of the world? Leo Varadkar speaking in uncharacteristically robust terms. He's quite a mild-mannered politician, Varadkar, responding to Cummings' revelations by essentially saying they were lying to us and we can't trust them. That's incredible. Nobody voted for that. Nobody voted to render the United Kingdom internationally untrustworthy. And yet that's what we've done. So just talk to me today, from, from whatever angle you like. Um, I'm just going to say, I'm glancing at the board, and I'm just going to say to Les in Cambridge, mate, I'm not going to take a call from you about how the EU has never um, supplied audited accounts. All right? It's 2021, Les. You voted for this absolute hellscape. It's time you owned it. And I, I, I very rarely do this, but I, I think you're probably listening to the wrong radio program now. If you're still barking up that particular tree, there's nothing I can do to help you. OK, so maybe stick a, I don't know, stick a record on. 22 minutes after 10 and, and one more thing, because I do care and I, and I do hate to see people contorting themselves into ludicrous positions to try and keep this balloon of nonsense inflated. But Dominic Cummings has merely confirmed what David Frost did yesterday. So don't waste your time texting me to say, oh, you can't trust Dominic Cummings. He's angry and he's bitter. Lord Frost is still our chief negotiator. And he, what he did yesterday has simply been described by Dominic Cummings as the plan all along. That's all. So what Lord Frost did yesterday was publicly uh, state that they have no intention of abiding by the terms of the deal that they signed. Uh, he, he publicly called upon the European Union, although he used uh, unhelpful language, to essentially clear up the mess that we have made. And, and all that Cummings has done, because I do care, if you still don't understand this, it's not because you're stupid, it's because you're too, too welded to, to, to the vote that you cast in 2016. But I, like the, like the police ungluing the hands of the protesters from the road i can unglue you from brexit if you let me so i'm not even going to mention your name if you're, if you're sending in texts that are just boneheadedly terrifying in their deliberate ignorance their willful ignorance this isn't about whether or not dominic cummings is trustworthy this is simply about david frost reneging upon the deal uh, refusing or, or 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 yeah refusing to abide by the terms of the negotiations that he conducted and Dominic Cummings saying that was the plan all along. That's where we are now. Martin is in Belfast. Martin, make sense of it all for me. Oh, James, I don't know if I can, mate. But it's confirmed my fears that uh, Boris obviously used the achievement of the Brexit and getting it done to get the huge vote that he got. And watching from afar, like over in Belfast, because we can't vote for Labour or Tory, I was like almost begging and hoping people wouldn't fall for it because I knew what was coming. And now we see Lord Frost, he's using where I live as a pawn. You know, the guy who negotiated this deal within two years is now coming and saying... Two years? It's eight well, months. He was doing uh, it by yeah, June. So he's now using us as a pawn and wants to remove the protocol. And it, we're the only part of the UK that's not queuing for petrol. We're not well, this is uh, this is why I'm glad my first call is is, is, is from Belfast, because... Some of the figures I've seen about the increase in trade from the Republic into the North are, I mean, they're, they're eyebrow raising. I, I don't know whether I, I shouldn't do stuff off the top of my head, so forgive me if I've misremembered, but I've seen 77% more than once, so sort of just shy of 80% increase in trade coming from the South to the North to replace the trade that used to come from, from Great Britain to to Northern Ireland. And you're quite right. I'm not hearing about queues outside petrol stations in Northern Ireland. I'm not hearing about anywhere near as many supply chain issues. So people unversed in the sectarian history of Northern Ireland will be wondering, 
What, what are you complaining about? What's the problem? You, you seem to have the best of both worlds. We, we do. We, we, like it's like Christmas has all come at once for us. You no, know, we've companies in the north that are shipping lorries across the border to like Rossler, and they've actually put on extra shipping routes to mainland Europe to like Calais, Brest, all these different places because there's that much business now. But Lord Frost wants to like almost use that as leverage and say, no, no, we can't have any customs borders in the Irish Sea, but it's not affected us at all. I mean, so so just, just for people un- unversed in the history, this is, a, a, this is an ideological problem for the unionists, and that is yeah. essentially the, 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 the fuel in David Frost's tank is trying to keep the unionists sweet. Yeah, yeah, and that's why we've seen the, the two leaders of the unionist parties have come out now and said, when we have the next election here, May 21, unless they remove the protocol, they're going to like bring the government down, and so we have to have another election. So they're now saying, no matter what the result of the election, we're not going to form a government again if unionism isn't the biggest party. <sighs> it's all gone crazy. No, I mean, I, and it, and I, we, I think we, on this side of the sea, I, I just think people would rather look the other way at the moment. Yeah, yeah, and that's understandable because I mean we, we couldn't agree on the colour of paint here sometimes. <laughs> but uh, all this here, we can't uh, get goods delivered from the UK. I mean, pre all this here, you might have seen different online delivery vans going around where I live, maybe once or twice a week, and mm. now there's, there's two or three vans a week from every company. I mean, it's business is booming, and and and, and, and the up. other. I mean, I know it is. <sighs> constitutionally irrelevant but of course Northern Ireland voted to remain under European Union um, uh, rules or, or whatever you want to call them and, and that is also missing from the rhetoric as well. Uh, Martin thank you I obviously calls from Northern Ireland today get a, a, a little bit of a bump up the switchboard but everybody is as always welcome. It is unbelievable it is uh, absolutely unbelievable that the deal that got them elected has been disowned and the bloke that put them into power has admitted that that was the plan all along. How do you process that? 0345 606 0973. And listen, if you voted for this, how do you feel today about the fact that you have helped turn our country, and by accident, absolutely understand that, you've helped turn our country into an international byword for untrustworthy? 0345 606 09 Seven three, or please ring me and tell me why that's not what's happened here at all. The 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 fact that David Frost is disowning his own treaty, disown, disowning his own deal, and Dominic Cummings is re- Dominic Cummings is revealing that that was always the plan, is either an inaccurate reading of the situation oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three, or nowhere near as bad as it looks from where I'm sitting, or where Leo Varadkar is sitting in Dublin, or where Martin is sitting in Belfast. So that's what's happened, I think. David Frost is disowning his deal, and Dominic Cummings has revealed that that was always the plan. Challenge that reading of of the the, the runes if you want. I don't know that you can, but I would welcome you trying on 03456060973. And then the, the second bit of it is, okay, yeah, that is actually what's happening here, James, but it's not bad. It's a good thing. It's, you know, I, 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 you come and drink my salty tears and tell me why this is what you actually wanted all along, Okay. And that's a genuine offer because nobody wants the country to suffer. Nobody genuinely thought that they were voting for economic sanctions. They just didn't believe the people that were telling them that. Nobody honestly thought that we'd end up with shortages in every sector in the country if we sent a message to all our foreign friends and neighbours that they weren't really welcome here. Or at least if they had to come here, they wouldn't be the same as us. They'd be sort of second class citizens. And if you want more evidence of my Nostradamus tendencies, do you remember how many times I told you to set your clock by how quickly the people who told you to sling out all the foreigners would turn their anger and seek to turn your hatreds upon the unemployed again? Do you remember how many times I told you that? Yeah, well, you can uh, you can stop your clocks now. Half past ten is the time. Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. 10.34 is the time. Do you want a quick snapshot of just how bonkers everything is, OK? As David Frost publicly disowns or seeks to disown the deal that got him a peerage and Boris Johnson elected um, in 2019 and Dominic Cummings, the so-called mastermind behind both of those, all three of those achievements, actually, Brexit, Johnson's uh, premiership and the withdrawal agreement is 
uh, going on the record now to say that the plan was always to renege on the deal, to disown. We, we, we signed it in bad faith. So if I were to say to you, true or false, Dominic Cummings has just said that cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. True or false? Cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. Tony Connolly is the Europe editor of RTE, and I'll ask him first. True or false, Tony? <laughs> I hoped you wouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, th- I think that if, if that is an assertion that the idea was to renege on the deal, that, that will certainly go down very badly. I think Leo Varadkar, the former Irish Taoiseach, has said that that would show that the UK had signed the treaty in bad faith if what Don, Dominic Cummings has said is correct. Um, and there are certainly plenty of people who believe that on recent evidence, the UK uh, effectively signed the withdrawal agreement with its fingers uh, crossed behind its back. Um, but and Frost didn't do see. much. David Frost didn't do much to disabuse us of that notion yesterday. I, I, I mean, it's always a little as Pretty Patel has taught us, to, to read too much into what appears to be a smirk can be un, un, unfair and even perhaps unkind. But that word was used to describe his response yesterday to the question of whether or not this was the plan all along. Yes, I mean, uh, I suppose people were looking at his speech to hear what he had to say uh, about the European Court of Justice and why that should be stripped out of the Northern Ireland Protocol. But uh, there were lots of other things he said yesterday which raised eyebrows. Uh, I think in particular the idea that the EU had used Northern Ireland to reverse the Brexit referendum or or to force the UK into a closer alignment. Um, I mean, that's a a trope which has done the rounds for a long time, but, you know, for for it to be coming direct from David Frost uh, was quite something. For, for the record, it was true. Uh, 14 minutes ago, he, he, he said that uh, uh, cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. But let's move on today to the, the, the offer that the European Union is going to make. To, to, to begin with, do you think it's a fair summation to say that the European Union is now straining every sinew to help clear up the mess that we have made? I mean, I, th- I think they, they have really tried to, to push the boundary of, of EU law, uh, but Obviously, the caveat there is that they're saying that the protocol is not going to be replaced. It's you know we're we're going to work within the parameters of the protocol and and European treaties, uh, and those treaties govern the shipment across borders of food, uh, which you know for member states is a very highly sensitive issue. You know people die if food is unsafe, uh, so they take their rules very safe, uh, very very carefully, or very seriously. Um, but I th- I think they are. Uh, going quite a distance to reduce the uh, number of checks and controls on goods mm. going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. I mean, I've heard the word massive reductions, uh, and that will cover both agri-food products, but also uh, the sphere of customs. Uh, I think customs formalities will be massively reduced, and also that there will be the free flow of medicines. Uh, and the fourth part of the of the stool, if you like, is the the role of Northern Ireland businesses, stakeholders. And, and the Northern Ireland Assembly, they will get an enhanced role in the ongoing management of the protocol. Um, a final point is that th- this is seen as you know not a take it or leave it package. This, this th- there will be, I suppose, the, the the papers to be published today will be a, a signpost of where the solutions lie, and then the, the sort of the technical detail will be thrashed out with the UK government. But this is, I mean, we're here again, and I, for, for the benefit of my listeners, I, I should say that Tony, who tweets as T Connolly RTE, and indeed presents or co-presents the Brexit Republic podcast has got a, a, a characteristically definitive thread on what uh, today's offer from the European Commission is is going to contain. But it, it, it is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, once again, technical detail on one side and, and still quite a large degree of ideological posturing or even not ideological anymore, rhetorical posturing on the other. And the, the point that will never, the twain that will never meet is the European Court of Justice, right? Yeah, I mean, th- this is a, an issue which has arrived late in the day from David Frost. Uh, I mean, this morning I was just going through all of his appearances before House of Commons or House of Lords committees, and he never once between January yeah. and July mentioned the ECJ as a problem when it comes to the Northern Ireland Protocol. The first time it surfaced as a problem was in the UK command paper on the 21st of July, and obviously he's been elaborating on that since, and it has been taken up by the DUP as a problem. Uh, So the suspicion is that this is a life-minute ruse, if you like, uh, to frustrate what the EU is doing. Why why would he want to do that? Why why would he want to frustrate what the EU is is doing in that way? And, And indeed... 
raise a standard around which the unionists can can gather? It is a, something of a parlour game trying to work out the UK strategy. Uh, tell, me, tell me about it. It's a living, though, Tony, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a living, exactly. Well, I mean, I suppose this, the you know the, the, the more cynical-minded people would say that this, that this is simply a pretext for the UK government to trigger Article 16 uh, and, and pull the whole mm. structure crashing down, or it is uh, simply a hardball negotiating tactic to tactic to try and extract maximum concessions ahead of, of, of a period of negotiations, you know, which is a completely legitimate way to approach things. Uh, we, we'll just have to wait and see. Indeed we will. And, I mean, when, when might that be, do you think? When would we expect to get a proper response from Frost as to what Sefcovic says today? I mean, I, I would imagine there will be some kind of response today. I mean, there will be certainly briefings going on from the British side here in Brussels and, and in London. But, I mean, things are going to move very quickly. Maros Shevchevich will be uh, travelling to London tomorrow uh, to, to talk uh, to Lord Frost, uh, or certainly his team will be travelling to London. So we are looking at a fairly intense, perhaps three-week period of, of discussions, negotiations, call it what you will. Uh, and and the, certainly the EU wants this all wrapped up by, by Christmas. Um, but of course, if the UK decides that no, this is not enough, we need the ECJ out of the protocol, or even as David Frost said yesterday, we need an entirely new protocol. Mm. Um, and if we don't get it, we're triggering Article 16, then that's a whole different uh, ballgame. I think we can all agree that Brexit hasn't been done yet, can't we? <laughs> yeah, I, I think well, certainly the relationship is going to be an ongoing issue for for months and years to come, keeping us all in jobs. Well, yeah, I suppose every cloud. Tony Connolly, RTE's Europe editor, also the author of Brexit and Ireland and the co-presenter of the Brexit Republic podcast, also one of those Twitter presences that can cut through all the noise and, and provide the um, insights, the detail, the knowledge, the, the facts that you need to form a proper opinion. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Tony. Thank you. That, that full tweet from Dominic Cummings that um, was tweeted just as I finished my introduction to the programme this morning. I'm sure that was a complete coincidence. Good faith blah. Listen to babble of student politics from SW1 insiders. Well, not me then. Infantilised by EU membership, it was international diplomacy versus people trying to cut your testicles off. Of course there wasn't, quote, good faith, end quotes. You clown. Newsflash. Cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. There it is. Rule Britannia. Oh, my God. It's come completely true. Hasn't it? Rule Britannia. Britannia waves the rules. That started as a joke. And now it's government policy. When I first did that gag to you, I just thought it was quite a nice little bit of wordplay. And it has now become, if Dominic Cummings' description of David Frost's behaviour is accurate, it's now become official government policy. According to the man that pushed Brexit over the line, Boris Johnson into Downing Street and the withdrawal agreement into law. Rule Britannia. Britannia waves the rules. Holy muckmoly. Even I'm getting a bit scared by the accuracy of this stuff now. 10.43 is the time. Margaret is in Belfast. Margaret, what would you like to say? Well, Tony, our, I was just listening to, to Tony Connolly there, mm. and obviously I agree with everything he said. But basically, uh, yes, when you say you're scared, I'm scared, because I really think that David Frost wants the... He wants to trigger Article 16. And if he does that, and he wants to do it as a distraction, and if he does that, it's going to be even more crazy here. I mean, we are quite happy with the way things this, are going. This is the bit that's missing from all of the mm -hmm. GB coverage. And yeah, not, only did you, not only did you vote to in the European Union yes, in, the, yes. in Northern Ireland, but the way that this deal is shaking down is good for you, good for the peace process, and most of the potential negatives are kind of being sucked up either at the border or, or in the south. Yes, exactly. And I think some of us are beginning to realise that the DUP wanted Brexit because they wanted a border back on the island. Really, you think you that? See, people, people don't realise that the DUP didn't vote for the Good Friday Agreement. No. They were against it. They didn't come into the original assembly. They only came in when uh, the, at the St Andrews Agreement. So they are anti-Good Friday Agreement. They're trying to pretend, no, they're not, but they were. So they are, they want to, they are quite happy to destabilise things as well because they are, you know, they're losing their power because they're decreasing in number. And um, 
you know, their friends uh, with David Frost and his ilk are helping them along. It helps. What, what happens, do you think, if, if Article 16 is triggered in, in, in this sort of hasty fashion that, that you posit? Uh, it's, you know, I, it's just frightening. I, I, I'd also add that Michael Gove authored, a, I think, a 58-page document yes. attacking the Good Friday Agreement, likening it uh, yeah. to the appeasement of the Nazis. That's right, I know. And, and uh, I, we, at the moment, we're quite happy. I, I went to my local shop the other day. The shelves are groaning. There's everything there. Everything so, so are my listeners. <laughs> and a lot of it is coming from from Dublin yeah. or Cork or wherever. I went to my butcher. I said, oh, I hear there's going to be a turkey shortage. Not at all. So what I they complain about, and, and they, I'm, I'm delighted to hear it, uh, genuinely, but what, what we fail to understand, and obviously with a name like mine, I'm a little bit more au fait with Irish history and Irish politics than a lot of my fellow Brits, but it is what the unionists, or the DUP in particular, that they the current arrangements make them feel less British. And that is all that we're talking about here, really. It's it's a feeling. They feel less British. They feel less British and they feel that because we are now probably working more closely with the South and we're getting more, there's more trade and more food. Oh my goodness, this is frightening because they're becoming friendly. We're becoming closer. Oops, my goodness, we might have a United Ireland. So we feel, we, we feel less British and our home feels more Irish and that scares the big Jesus out of them. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And it's why they are, of course, they are having, you know, background meetings with, Frost, etc., and they're all working together. And Jeffrey Donaldson has threatened to pull down the assembly. Yes. But Jeffrey Donaldson's probably having phone calls at night with his friend David Frost, where they're agreeing what they should do next. And the rest of us who voted to remain uh, are watching all this, and we're scared. And when there was trouble here um, at Easter time, we think that was all just, you know, whipped up by a few disgruntled. Um, well, right. politicians. Yeah, no, I, 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 I hear you. I, what a, I mean, if I was in charge, what would the, what would happen if I? Well, if I was in charge, it, we, we, we'd, we'd all be over by Christmas. But if somebody just had a a referendum in Northern Ireland on whether or not you stay as you are now or you go back to the table to negotiate, I think there'd be a majority for staying as you are now. Or would the DUP be able to mobilise enough votes? Do you mean? Uh, to, to remain in the EU or to well, keep no, the no, protocol? Well, no, this is not just to keep the protocol as it is now. To keep, I think most people would want to keep the protocol. It's hard to under... I mean, apart from that strength of feeling less British, mm-hmm. and that seems to be a, 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 in, in abeyance. And, of course, when people start weighing up the, um, the, the, the groaning supermarket shells versus the army being brought in to deliver petrol, you'd probably be hard-pressed to make much of a case for wanting to be more like mainland Britain than mainland Ireland. Uh, 10.48 is the time. Margaret, thank you. Um, I, I, obviously, if you're in Northern Ireland and you don't like the messages that I'm getting from your fellow countrymen and women, then feel free to redress the balance on 03456060973. But that, sorry, it's really got me that. that, that, that I mean, it was a joke. Rule Britannia, Britannia waves the rules. And Dominic Cummings himself has revealed that that was always the actual policy. And that line there, I don't know whether you find it haunting or not, but that line there, the, the, <laughs> is it cheating foreigners? That's, uh, <laughs> cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. No one votes. I mean, all right, maybe people like Farage voted for that, but you didn't. I, I, I'm, I'm sticking with that analogy, all right? You're like, you're like insulate Britain protesters. You've glued your hands to the road. But if you haven't worked out by now that I have got the solvents that you need, then you never will. And the solvents are just called facts. Tony knows what I'm talking about. As a repentant Leave voter, the UK government's um, word can never be internationally trusted. It used to be 100%, now it's 0%. And why? Because we're led by dishonourable, dissembling, proven liar. And, And don't take Tony's word for it, or mine. Take... The man that put him into Downing Street. It's quite remarkable, this. I'd, and I'd, I'd take any call you want on the subject, because I think, once again, we find ourselves at the sort of vanguard of, of reality. Uh, it, it, the temptation to talk about other stuff or to pretend that this isn't happening or to pretend that it's not bad as it actually is, is is fairly big, even for people who saw it coming. But for people who promised you that this was going to be great, sunlit uplands, having your cake and eating it, 
rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. For those people who still dominate the UK media, you have to remember that the media is the lens, the passage, the vessel through which we receive information, and they are still committed to the con that they fell for. Most of them weren't part of the con, they just fell for it. And here we are now. Rule Britannia, Britannia waves the rules. 10.54 is the time. It, it's felt often over the last few years a bit like an anxiety dream. You know, the talk about the cliff edge that we were heading for, the talk about the reality of what would happen when the uh, decision to leave the customs union as a single market met the Good Friday Agreement. That, that just, that, You know, those anxiety dreams when you scream and no noise comes out. And I say that as someone who gets three hours a day on the radio to, to, to scream into the ether. And if no noise comes out, then the emergency tape kicks in and you'll hear Steve Allen talking about Christmas crackers. So, But it has felt like that on occasions. And it feels a bit like that again today, you know? I, I, I don't know what you would use to distract the great British public from the horrors potentially on the horizon, but there's plenty to choose from. You know, no shortage of... Uh, eco protesters or firework displays to talk about instead of talking about the potential catastrophe that has been visited upon these islands um, by the cynicism and dishonesty of our leaders. And don't take my word for it. David Frost stood up yesterday and sought to disown his own deal. And Dominic Cum Cummings woke up this morning and revealed that that was the plan all along. 10.55 is the time. Joe is in Froome in Somerset. Joe, what would you like to say? <sighs> I'd like to say I'm so, so pleased to have opportunity to speak with you that I live in England and I care deeply about Northern Ireland. 37 years ago yesterday, my dad was killed by the IRA in the Brighton bomb. Oh. And I've dedicated my life to understand, bring empathy um, to find a way to really understand the conflict there. And you're, I care you're Joe so Berry. deeply. You're the, yeah. the, the daughter of Sir Anthony Berry. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Thank um, you for calling. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you for having me today because it was the anniversary yesterday. I, I noticed. And I actually spoke at a kindness festival in Leeds because I wanted to do something positive. And now speaking with you is also part of that. I want people in Northern Ireland to know that some of us do care here, care deeply about the peace process, feel it's a shared responsibility, and have built such empathy and the idea that we rule the waves. Like, we don't even want to rule the waves. We want to create a world with empathy and trust. Mm. And so it just really deeply wounds me, but I care so much about the peace process and what's happening in Northern Ireland. What threats do you see being posed to the peace process by the current direction of traffic, Joe? Well, there's a lack of trust um, that's just growing and growing. Um, and so the divisions are going to get bigger. The fact that the border, like, I remember the day after Brexit, um, after referendum, my thought was, what about the Good Friday Agreement? What about the border? And well, I remember Theresa my, May had actually to... warned about it prior to the referendum vote, but then barely mentioned it again once she became Prime Minister. Yeah, and I think that's a betrayal to the people of Northern Ireland. Like, we need to go there and listen. It took, I think, three or four years for anyone to go to the border and actually mm. ask what, what it's like living there, um, what does it mean for them. And it's already changed drastically for people who live near the border. So there's uncertainty. Um, you know, I'm always hopeful because I believe hope is a form of nonviolence, but at the moment I feel really, feel <laughs> really worried um, about what's ahead for people in Northern Ireland and um, I think we can give a message out that so many of us do care and tell our own politicians as you are you know that it's not it's not okay you know we really need to think about the impact on Northern Ireland of what happens with the peace process changed so many people's lives I mean not just there but here you know, and it was and it's studied around the world it's, it was amazing it was an amazing feat of negotiation of people creating that trust we have to keep working at that. She, you, you, you use the word trust, and Dominic Cummings writes things like, for all the cant about international law, states break it every week. The idea it's the epitome of morality is low-grade student politics pushed by lawyers and officials to constrain politics they oppose. He writes about how cheating foreigners is a, is, is a core part of the job, and he writes about how 
they had to prioritize getting their Brexit over the line um, above uh, and any concerns about the situation in Northern Ireland? I, I, that, I mean, th- 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 these words must chill you. Absolutely chill me. And I see that as like the old way of communication doing politics where we have power over you, we control. It justifies us not, not caring and, and doing appalling things. But to me, what we're working at is actually bringing compassion and empathy. You know, and that's where you're so right is about recognizing that we we all can be right you know mm. we all have our story you know and my book that i'm writing is called beyond right and wrong which is like showing actually we can listen and empathize and our enemies are just people whose stories we haven't heard so we have to create a world where there is no other and we work we work as a whole global family so that that way of thinking is just i just see it as 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 just out outdated and just going to lead to more suffering and it's suffering that we that we're hopefully trying to change and right now it seems there's a lot of suffering but i still believe in the resilience of humanity and we can, perhaps we can change our leadership for one that's more compassionate i think you have to uh, you know the, the the alternative is too bleak to contemplate joe how can people find out more about that about yeah. the, the work that you do how can people find out more about the the, the, the activism and the oh, reconciliation work that you do um well i have a charity building bridges for peace and also my own website um joe dash com. so I can't even think today no <laughs> I, I can understand why so and, and, and of course Honestly, the anniversary you keep me alive. You keep, well you keep me sane you know, I, I love listening to you and, you and it's an absolute honour I know that you've supported my friend Vegan Murray and I know you're, you're just the most yeah so compassionate yourself so Thank you for having well, me on today. Right. Well, thank you. And, and um, all, all, all of my listeners will join me in, in wishing you all the very best, particularly on that anniversary of your, of your um, father's murder. <sighs> Joe Berry there, um, uh, the, the, the daughter of Sir Anthony Berry, who was uh, killed uh, by the IRA in the Brighton Hotel bombing on the 12th of October 1984. Warning, I think, in the most uh, well, breathtakingly warm and compassionate of terms of, of, of the dangers of not being fully aware of the threat currently being posed to the Northern Irish peace process by the attempts to abandon the Northern Ireland Protocol by the man that negotiated it and sold it to the nation as oven ready, as revealed by uh, the man pulling his strings at the time uh, to have been the plan all along. I, I mean, come on. If, if this isn't the morning where you think, ah, crikey, all right, yeah, this isn't great, then I worry, as Joe Berry, I think, clearly does, that that morning will never dawn. It's five minutes after 11 and it is, um, well, I, I think only right that we continue with this conversation for a little longer, given the identity of the last caller, the last contributor. The, the Northern Irish peace process, it's not under existential threat or mortal threat yet, but it is clearly something that the UK government doesn't really care about. And, and I say that with an incredible combination of heavy heart and disbelief. And listen, Dominic Cummings is about as trustworthy well, as everybody else who was part of the Vote Leave movement, um, from the two co-chairmen right right down to the lowliest um, uh, sort of Facebook troll. But the <laughs> stop clock argument comes into play, um, inevitably, and also the fact that all he's done is essentially confirm what many of us suspected all along. The plan was always to abandon the deal. It was not oven ready. And the callers from Belfast essentially telling us that what Frost is dealing with here, this is the bit I don't get actually, um, and, and maybe you can help me with this. Why is it so important now if the people in Northern Ireland are generally happy with what's happening on the ground in terms of observable facts, the people who are unhappy with it are coming from a point of emotion. They're unhappy that the checks coming into Northern Ireland, and, and I'm, I'm constructing this as a potential light at the end of the tunnel for all of us. I think the people in Northern Ireland are generally happy. They don't have shortages. The increase in trade coming from the south to the north is exponential. I can't see any reason why that wouldn't sustain or why that wouldn't hold. Um, the people who are unhappy are coming from a place of feeling rather than fact. They're unhappy, the DUP in particular, because they don't feel as British. The fact that you have to have goods checked coming into Belfast in a way that you don't when they're coming into Birmingham is an emotional affront to them. I don't want to make it sound trivial because it is part of their very identity and with Joe Berry's words echoing in my ears about 
um, people, other people's stories. But that is, I think, a statement. It's an emotional response. And listen, most of us make some of the biggest decisions in our lives as the result of emotional responses, like getting married, for example. So it's important not to denigrate that too completely. But the objections to the current scenario are largely emotional and the support for the current scenario are largely intellectual. So what is Frost playing at? That's the bit I don't quite get. Um, maybe it's really obvious and I'm just a bit fuzzy-headed this morning. Does he, does he need to keep the DUP sweet? Or does he need to keep the fires of enmity burning so that your sort of average Daily Express reader uh, will not look at what's actually happening and continue to focus instead upon this imagined enemy? Even as later today, that imagined enemy will bend quite far in the pursuit of protecting the protocol and therefore the peace process. I don't know. And again, the temptation that you and I have as relatively intelligent people to think there must be a, a plan here, there must be a, an end game, there must be a goal, is still there, isn't it? Even after all this time of realising that there was never any plan and there was never any goal. It was all about just the next 24-hour news cycle or... Uh, offering up the British public whatever nonsense would keep them sweet for another 10 minutes. You've seen that with coronavirus. Yesterday's report proved it. And here I am saying to you, what do you think David Frost's endgame is? Whereas it could be as simple as saying he just needs to keep he needs to keep the, 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 the fires burning. There is no endgame. He just needs to keep the enemy status of the European Commission, in this case the European Union in general, he needs to keep that fight aflame because as soon as we stop fighting... We're going to see what we've done to the country. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud and inviting you to do the same. Brenda is in Crumlin in County Antrim. Brenda, what would you like to say? James, you were just talking about Frost and the DUP, and I think they're actually very similar in many ways. The DUP have been unscared because trade is up between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, yes. which is kind of going to make an economic Ireland more um, happen maybe sometime in the future. And Frost is worried about it all working out beautifully here. Why? Why? Just, Why? Well, it proves the point that the single market and the customs union are a good thing. So if we're all sweet over here in Northern Ireland, what are the rest of you poor lot in Great Britain? Well, Why are it you is the thing. All these shortages? No, it's a great point, and it fits the hole that I just dug. Um, but in, in the context of the rhetoric, the comparison between... I think for a lot of people in, in, in Great Britain, if we were to look at Northern Ireland and see everything's going swimmingly and it isn't here, we would probably be about 60 to 70% of that if it was the Republic of Ireland. Do you see what I mean? I, I, Frost is really, really worried that we're going to make comparisons between Birmingham and Belfast and see that Belfast has got a much better deal. But are we not just as likely to make comparisons between Doncaster and Dublin? You, you, you'll tell I'm fond of alliterations there, Brenda. <laughs> Absolutely, James. But, but actually, no, because no. Dublin is still wholly within the EU, yeah, yeah, whereas yeah. Belfast supposedly isn't. No, so, so um, it's a much starker you know, comparison, isn't it? Absolutely. And the DUP, I've listened to them over the terminably since 2016. Um, DUP MPs have been very happy to come on local radio here and say they're happy to lose 40,000 jobs in the north of Ireland. They want a hard border. They do not want to see anything happening to their hard border on the island of Ireland. And, and you and really think, that, like an earlier caller there. did, that they would want to go back to, to, a, to a segregated island? Totally, 100%. And Frost is 100%. what? But Frost is stumbling towards that because he's got no choice, or Frost is actually on the same page as them, in your opinion? In my opinion, there's very little difference between them other than Frost really does care. Yeah, about okay. Him. So really for him, it just, it just postpones reality for another 10 minutes. It's just, it's the typical, the whole government has been one lie after another. They open their mouth, you, you know there's going to be a lie. And I mean, it's just who, as you say yourself, totally untrustworthy. Well, he boasts about it. I mean, yeah, that, that is. I, I wish I was making this up. I still can't quite believe that, no, it, that no. he said it out loud. You know, the bit about that cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. Of course, 
Sure, you don't need to go back over anything that's been written by either of the whole shore of them. Mm. It's that's just their, that's just what they are. So I don't know. Um, I've sent your researcher. The Good Friday Agreement allowed me as a nationalist to feel comfortable in Northern Ireland and Britain because the Irishness was assured. Yeah. You start putting borders up, that's going to change. And and one does then return to the, the thoughts and the words of people like Michael Gove and, and the comparison of the Good Friday Agreement to Nazi appeasement and wonder whether... Well, then we're back to wondering whether there is some sort of sinister master plan in place. Brenda, thank you. Uh, 30 minutes after 11 is the time. And, and that, I mean, some flesh on the bones. As I said, she filled up a bit of the hole that I've dug, but I still don't quite get it. And why, I, I, well, that is, in the absence of another answer, that's the one we're going to run with. Fr- Frost knows that if Northern Ireland stays it is, as it is now, then the difference between Belfast and Birmingham is going to become clearer by the day, uh, which means that everybody on this side of the Irish Sea is going to be going, why the hell are we? On the wrong end. Why are we at the dirty end of this stick? You can open all the free ports you want and change the colour of our passport until it looks like Joseph's coat. But but Belfast is in a better place than Birmingham is because of the Customs Union. So why are we out of it? And, and if he can get Northern Ireland uh, more firmly welded to Great Britain so that they suffer more of the privations and problems that we're suffering, then it would become harder to make the comparison between membership and non-membership. That's an absolutely horrible analysis. But you look me in the eye and tell me that you don't believe it. Dennis is in Southwark. Dennis, what would you like to say? Hello, I'm, uh, I'm from Northern Ireland, as you can hear. Hi, but I live in London now. Um, I was a founder member of the Alliance Party in uh, 51 years ago. And I really come with a message of hope because we can talk to the cars come home about so what on earth David Frost is thinking about, etc., etc. I of think course. you've probably done that one out. Um, well, we now I, I, have to yeah. say what's going to happen now. Yeah. And what's going to happen now is um, that the DUP are going to suffer more and more electorally. Um, the Alliance Party, as you probably know, is Protestants and Catholics working together roughly in the proportions that they are in the community. Yes. And um, they have been struggling, of course, through the troubles uh, and I can well remember all of that. But um, they are now doing very well in the polls. The last poll I looked at, they were equal, equal to the DUP. Mm. Uh, just take that in, in Northern Ireland. And when there is an election, that will come through and more and more as the DUP stumble in the way that they're doing at the moment. There's one in May, uh, isn't there? So there's, one, think, there's, one coming up, there, there's one coming up in yeah, May, I think. Exactly, yeah. in May, and it may even be beforehand, before that. If in some way the DUP are absolutely stupid enough to to uh, to bring down the assembly, um, so there 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 is hope. And uh, the other point I wanted to mention to you was you were asking the previous caller about Article 16. What actually happens yes. if Article 16 is implemented? Well, it is not. Article 16 does not say you can simply walk away from everything. It merely says that negotiations would have to commence. That the that the protocol would be suspended in inverted commas and there would be negotiations which would try and get to what what would it get to something much different from where we are today and if there was no agreement the eu would then impose sanctions on the uk uh, there there would be even worse problems uh, with the with trade uh, than there are at this moment, and they're bad enough, God knows. But politi- so, um, politically speaking... Poli- and the, the, on, the blame would be placed by the British government yeah. on the EU. There we are. They're nasty. Look what they're doing to us. Look what they're doing to us. And they may even continue to win on that. Um, the gullibility of the electorate um, on, uh, in Great Britain, I have to say, really surprises me. And I wonder how long it will go. Uh, and, That's uh, my yes. message. Well, no, Dennis, that's a really powerful contribution. I, it's not exactly optimistic or uplifting, but the idea that, that a lot of what is being done is designed to just keep the Brexit battles burning because that is the only thing that sustains their power. And, and I think, actually, I don't know whether, Dennis, you'd agree with this, but the, 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 a large part of the... Uh, free pass given to yesterday's revelations about the um, uh, early days, early months, early year of response to the coronavirus pandemic is probably linked to that. I've, I've said all along that if you, if you, you know, that scarf around your neck, that Brexit scarf tied so t- tightly around your neck that it's cut off the flow of blood to your brain. And if your brain was working properly, you'd be absolutely livid 
about what was contained in that joint report yesterday. And I mean, you'd probably be looking also today at the fact that we are way ahead of pretty much every other European country when it comes to new cases and deaths. And we're slipping down the table of vaccinations. But we're not talking about that anymore. And anyway, Boris Johnson's got a, he's doing a painting today, according to the newspapers, or he's doing some painting yesterday when those reports were published. Not, not like, you know, doing the spare room. He was painting a picture on an easel on a veranda of the hacienda owned by uh, the son of a billionaire who got a seat in the House of Lords after losing his seat in the House of Commons. But at least we got rid of all those unelected bureaucrats. 21 minutes after 11 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the conversation is not exactly cheerful. I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. Luckily, we can be cheerful. We can be cheerful, we can be compassionate, and we can be kind to each other, even as we discuss a, a, a relative hellscape. In this case, crazy, crazy business um, uh, regarding David Frost disowning the deal that got Boris Johnson elected and got him a seat in the House of Lords, and Dominic Cummings confirming that that was the plan all along because cheating foreigners, and I quote now, the Barnard boy. I quote the Barnard Castle boy, okay? Cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. This as we go out into the world um, claiming to be global Britain and calling upon future trading partners to treat us with trust and to uh, respect our uh, good faith approaches. That's incredible, right? I mean, genuine. again, I know you're not ready to ring me yet, but you will be soon. Uh, and you don't have to say sorry or anything like that. It, 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 no one voted for this. Nobody voted for a government of cheats. Um, and even if they did it by accident, now that they've admitted or uh, uh, key player has admitted that they were cheats and liars, how do you cling on to that carcass? How do you do it? I do not know. Pal of mine, uh, John Laverty, who's the executive editor of the Belfast Telegraph, um, takes up a couple of points um, that earlier callers from, from Northern Ireland have, have made goes a little further. A couple of things. There's an election coming up in Northern Ireland next May. And although the DUP and the Ulster Unionists appear to be on the same page regarding the protocol, they're fighting each other to be the main unionist party next year. The Ulster Unionists have got a major boost with the introduction of Doug Beattie, the so-called Beattie Bounce, as leader. Today, he's seen as a moderniser, which is a very relative term. I should. Uh, this is me now commentating on John's message. Um, uh, Moderniser being a very relative term in Northern Irish unionist politics. John Laverty goes on, today's concessions from the EU won't appease the DUP because the symbolic Irish sea border will still be there. Symbolic there being what I was talking about, this being about feelings. Um, this is merely the first of two major bumps in the road. The second will come when, as is currently expected, Sinn Féin become the largest party in the Assembly next year. The unionists will refuse to allow a Sinn Féin leader to become first minister, even though, once again, it's only symbolic, because the first minister and the deputy first minister is a, is a joint post, and one can't countermand the other. And uh, with his tongue planted firmly in his cheek, he concludes fun times ahead, James. But we're back to flipping passports and sovereignty. We're back to the way you feel being more important, or the way someone feels being more important than the economy, the reality, the actuality. It's incredible. And we're doing it all again. Why are we doing it all again? Because arguably it's the only thing that keeps the B word balloon inflated. Uh, 0345 is the number you need if you want to join in. Have we taken a call from Great Britain yet today? Apart from Joe Berry, had a very pertinent perspective on... I don't know, but anyway, we're going back to County Down now. Jay's in Banbridge. Jay, what would you like to say? How you doing, uh, James? Jerry, by the way. Um, Jerry, not it's, Jay. It's My apologies. No, 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 no. You and I have spoken before. The last time you and I spoke was just after Johnson had been over here with the DUP oh, yes. and got on like somebody's drunken uncle at a wedding. <laughs> when he, yes, um, that was amazing footage. Was that when he swore blind that there'd be no border in the Irish Sea and that there'd be exactly absolutely no... And, and here we and are, Jerry, and here we are. He loved them. <laughs> yeah, told them how much he loved them and then what did he do? He went and betrayed them. And he'll do it again like he betrays everybody. But the whole thing about the, this protocol, I th I'd always thought there was a number of scenarios. Number one, they didn't know what they signed, and mm. they signed it in such haste to get it over the line. The other one crawled into the back of my mind, and they said they're going to renege, they're going to go back on it, they're going to repudiate it as soon as they possibly can. But why would they do that? Because who would deal with them? 
Who, who would sign a deal with Roger the Dodger and Marbella? Yeah. I mean, those of us of a certain age remember Roger the Dodger and his book of weaves and He's still Dodgers going. and cunning He's plans. Still going. Oh, He's still it's, going. It's wild. Yeah. But I actually think what, what Frost is trying to do to poke the bear of the EU that much, that the EU will put up a border here in Ireland. And I think that's that at the end of the day is the 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 secret the secret scenario. We'll not put up a border. Oh no, 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 we won't put up borders. Let the EU put up the borders and we can go, look lads, we told you we didn't want a border. Yeah. Blame those bad EU. And the, and it doesn't matter how it plays in the rest of the world, as long as it plays well in the Brexit supporting press, then it's and a it's a win, even though it's a disaster absolutely. for everybody. And they don't do not care one fig for anything that happens here in, in in the north of Ireland. And all your callers so far, I'm sure there are people who disagree, but yeah. I'm sure all your callers, particularly like a Tony Connolly and John Laverty who really know their stuff, mm. and what he's saying, well actually, we are doing pretty well with the protocol. Well, we the are thing. the best of both worlds. Yeah. That's the you mad know, thing. Um, That's the mad yeah. thing from this side of the sea. The, this, I mean, that is missing entirely from whatever coverage the stories are getting is, is the fact that the, the, the situation on the ground in Northern Ireland is dem- demonstrably and measurably better than the situation on the ground in Great Britain. Plus, we still have freedom of movement. When you denied freedom of movement to those nasty foreigners, they forgot that they also were denying it to themselves. My son works in Spain. He has an Irish passport. He has mm. absolutely no worries about being chucked out of the country or because he has an Irish passport, he still has freedom of movement. So do all his uh, guys of his uh, of his era. They're all happily working away in Europe with their Irish passports going, we love freedom of movement. I mean, the whole thing, it's just, it's, it's, it's mad. It the is. whole thing is mad. Would that, and that's just so sad. Would that have been, the, the Dennis who was on earlier, did you hear him? I did. Would that, that would be Dennis Loretto, would it, do you think? I think so, yeah. yeah. I should have been a little bit more... Well, I was, I'm was. i always respectful, Jerry. I was res- Apart from getting your name that, wrong. Apart from getting your name wrong, I was respectful to yeah, you as well, but I probably should have, right, cl- I should have clocked that that was Alliance Party um, founder and former chair, Dennis Loretta. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, that's the scary thing. you get your own Irish passport soon. It's, well, it's in the pipeline. It's in the pipeline. Just got to find a lawyer. It's really hard to find a lawyer at the moment. To, to oh, put, I know, I know. But it, no, I know, it is. Okay. I mean, that will be the first tangible benefit of Brexit. Uh, Brian is coming home. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but if if you were sitting somewhere and you saw David Frost yeah. and the like of those Tories coming to make a deal with you, <laughs> well, this you, is the you, bit I don't get. The rings on your fingers, or I get counting the rings on their fingers. In it's, 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 tell me it's raining. I'd, I'd 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 buy a sun hat. You're not wrong. And this is the weird thing about the Cummings intervention today. The line there about. Uh, Cheating foreigners is, is, is a core part of the job. 28 minutes after 11. God knows what's happening to Irish and Northern Irish radio today. Everybody's listening to us. 0345 is the number if you want to join in. Nolig is in Cork. Nolig, what would you like to say? Hi, we're watching in horror from Ireland, to be honest, in what's going on with the UK. Um, <laughs> my worry is that Frost and Co., um, I think that the European Union is something like the UK Union. Yeah. In the UK Union, there was a vote for Brexit, and both Northern Ireland and Scotland voted against, but it didn't matter. Yes. They still had to do Brexit. But in the European Union, they're not going to put a border in Ireland for two reasons. And one is, if they do, that's the death knell of the EU. They can't. Right. It's too many small states in it. They will not do that. And secondly... Uh, it breaks the Good Friday Agreement, and the U.S. is in of that. Yeah. Nancy Pelosi had John Hume stay in her house when he was for there. She did, yeah. In for the Good Friday Agreement, she's going to protect that. Whatever, everything, whatever. Well, being. How does it so, roll out then, Nolik? How, well, what's what happens? Because I'd like Jerry's analysis was, I mean, it was sound, but as you point out, it, it possibly overlooked the reactions outside the island of Ireland, most notably America. But it's hard not to think that this might be what Frost is hoping for, to push the European Union into a position oh. where they have to protect their market. There, There is no doubt that this is what the DUP want. They right. only have 13% of the electorate in Northern. Ah, yeah. They're losing ground, and the only way they can keep ground is to stoke up fear in a hard border. Yeah, But it's never going to happen. So, and Frost can say what he wants. That doesn't make it fact. So what is going to happen? <laughs> I think that the UK will accept the protocol. They'll vote in Northern Ireland and it will be either um, to accept the protocol as is and or a maybe a United Ireland, but I don't think anyone's ready for that. <laughs> I don't, no one wants to touch that one. I just well, think, Although you could um, have a majority, you could have a Sinn Féin majority on both sides. 
not not in the not too distant future, which would really put the cat among the pigeons. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think anybody now they'd be very welcome if they wanted to. But you know, um, baby steps first protocol. Indeed, uh, protocol. Yeah. It's, it's the only thing that preserves peace. It's the only thing that gives the best. What, what does that actually? I'm a little bit late for the news, so just answer this one briefly because I bang my yeah. head against the desk. It's, it's a bit de- deja vu for me now. These conversations. The first time I even had Jacob Rees Mogg telling me that everything was going to be fine in Northern Ireland, and you you sort of think, well, maybe yeah. I'm the maybe Maybe I'm the one that's deluded because it seems to me that two plus two equals four. But there's a fellow over here wearing a monocle and a top hat and he swears blind two plus two equals five. How did those sort of messages play out in the Republic when you had very senior British politicians essentially claiming that night was day when it came to the Good Friday Agreement smashing into the customs union? (laughs) Say again. Mortified for uh, for you. Yeah, I you know, I mean, it. honestly, Frost, Dominic Cummings, if this is what's leading your government, Boris, good Lord. I mean, guys, there's much better people in the UK. <laughs> Why are you letting these people lead you? You know, I mean, crashed your economy, you're on your knees, and now they're trying to keep it there for the next 50 years. <sighs> Why? Well, when you put it like that, Nolik, <laughs> when you put it like that, I suppose that, you, yeah, crikey, well, that's how we look. What was it Rabbi Burns said? Just a hop from, from, from Ireland back to Scotland. Uh, God... God grant us the gift to see us as... Oh, never mind. I'll look it up during the the news headlines and they get it right after the headlines with Thomas Watts. Reasons why I love my job. Chapter 412. I go off into the break, promising to look up a Rabbi Barnes poem. And I see Theo Oshwood strolling past the studio, calling him in for a bit of a chin wag. Completely forget to look up the Rabbi Barnes poem. Think, I can't come back and do a scintillating introduction to the next stage of the programme while simultaneously Googling to try and find... I know what I'll do. I'm absolutely certain that at least 48 of my esteemed listeners, of, of great listeners to the Great British Radio Show, will have done either off the top of their heads or they'd have done the work for me. In front of the queue is Peter in Bexley. Would that were the power gears to see ourselves as others see us. In other words, if only God would let us see ourselves as others see us. And I think Nolag in Ireland uh, in Cork there a moment ago gave us precisely that power to see ourselves as others see us. But it doesn't matter because Britannia waves the rules. And it is beginning to look that simple. I've got something clever to say. We, have we got a sound effect for that, Keith? What, tumbleweed, is it? Or, or, or perhaps a chinny-chin-chin chin type noise. I've got something clever to say. Yeah, chinny-chin-chin. Chin. Um, but no, I will. I, I think I might summon the Usherwood. Are we ready for that? Go, summon the Usherwood! Crikey, that was quick. Very quick. Gavin Barwell. Uh, former Chief of Staff to Theresa May. Now, of course, he lost his seat in 2017 in that general election. And because of tensions between uh, Theresa May, uh, her number 10 operation and backbenchers, he went to work as Chief of Staff Mm. uh, for uh, Mrs May in number 10 and was integral to negotiating the first deal uh, with um, uh, the European Union. And, and of course, you will remember that going into uh, 2018, uh, Boris Johnson was Foreign Secretary. And then he resigned because Theresa May proposed what became known as the Chequers deal. And the Chequers deal was a a customs union arrangement alignment right across mainland Great Britain and Northern Ireland because, of course, the Prime Minister said that no no British Prime Minister could accept the Northern Irish backstop. Now, following that Chequers deal in the summer of 2018, Boris Johnson, of course, resigned as the Foreign Secretary. And he went to the Conservative conference in the autumn of you missed 2018. That, you, missed, you missed out the bit where he got a photographer to come in and take a picture of him resigning. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's all right. Carry on. So he, resi- he resigned as Foreign Secretary and then went to the Conservative Party uh, conference uh, campaigning to chuck checkers. Yes. Get rid of checkers. He did. And Gavin Barwell, interestingly, was speaking about this this morning to the Institute of Government uh, and told uh, that uh, it was a sort of podcast type thing that actually uh, Boris Johnson didn't actually understand. This is despite being Foreign Secretary, of course, uh, the implications of that Northern Ireland protocol. The logical consequence of Brexit, uh, certainly the kind of Brexit that the Prime Minister uh, would want, where you you completely out of the EU's regulatory orbit is a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Mm. If you're an independent country that is not in regulatory alignment with its neighbours and is not in some kind of customs union with its neighbours, you have customs checks and you have regulatory checks when goods cross your border. And that is not an acceptable uh, answer in in terms of the Northern Ireland-Ireland border. And we've never really fronted up to what the actual choices were. If you think back to 
the 2018 conference mm. when Boris was campaigning against Chequers, he was telling everyone, I'm going to get a trade deal for the whole of the UK with no Northern Ireland protocol. Mm. It didn't happen. Yeah. You know, my observation would be too many people in our politics are complacent that the progress that we've seen in Northern Ireland is guaranteed to stick. Mm. And I don't think it is. And I think the whole way we have handled that issue is putting that progress at risk. Gosh. So yeah. the accusation... So this is quite an interesting division between Cummings and Johnson then, because Cummings would claim, and mm. I stress again that he is a bloke that claimed to be testing yeah. his eyesight when he drove to Barnard Castle, so trustworthy is not a word you'd apply to him, but he would claim that they knew exactly what they were doing. Yes, but he also claimed that Boris Johnson didn't know what he was doing because he right. also claimed in a tweet last night that Boris Johnson didn't understand what the customs union was until November last year. Yeah, which is even later than the Dean Dorries. It if Nadine well. Dorries ever actually understood what so, the And that was, of course, when Dominic Cummings, Dominic Cummings left the government in November last year. Um, so, so Johnson never thought beyond the rhetoric is the accusation so from the, Barwell? So, so the accusation from Gavin Barwell is that he was perfectly happy to go to that Conservative yeah. Party conference to chuck checkers, saying that you didn't need a Northern Ireland protocol because he didn't understand yes. why you would need a Northern Ireland protocol because the logical explanation is to have a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland if we are to leave the European Union's regulatory orbit, as he described it. But of course you can't do that because of the Good Friday Peace Agreement. Yeah. So what Gavin Barwell is saying... But, which, is which, but again, but Jacob Rees-Mogg we didn't actually sit in the studio. We, we ambushed him on Parliament Green, but he claimed that that was all hogwash and nonsense. I think I remember that interview. Yeah. And yes. But, but the point that Gavin Barwell is, is making is that Boris Johnson went to the Conservative Party conference, and this was a key... This was a key moment because this was when the Boris Johnson and that Chuck Checkers, and I was there when Boris Johnson addressed a packed auditorium mm -hmm. of Conservative members, really galvanised party membership opinion against Theresa May, who That's was then right. Prime Minister. It was in, it was in, that was a conference in Birmingham. Theresa May did understand the repercussions. She did, and Gavin Barwell understood the repercussions as, as, her, uh, as her chief of staff. But Gavin Barwell has also been speaking, James, about the implications for that reneging on the deal or saying that you put your fingers behind your back and, and you didn't you signed up something in bad faith. Because cheating foreigners is a core part of the job. Copyright Dominic Cummings. Copyright today. today. But Gavin Barwell says that that actually has far-reaching implications for how we do business in the future. No kidding. I'm not saying that the current situation in Northern Ireland should stay. I don't like the, this iteration of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Theresa fought tooth and nail mm. to, drop, to knock the EU off this idea of having a Northern Ireland uh, only arrangement. But my problem is that if you agree something uh, and you fight an election saying what a fantastic deal this is, and then almost immediately afterwards you start trying to unpick the thing, yeah. the danger is the people you're negotiating with think you didn't agree it in good faith in the first place. And that makes it much more challenging when you're then trying to renegotiate it. And my fear is that the prospectus that David set out yesterday which is basically the entire thing has to be ripped up and you have to accept our version of it, mm. has no chance of success and is going to do even further damage to our relationship with our nearest neighbours. Um, who is going to gain if the UK falls out with the EU? We're not going to gain. The EU's not going to gain from it. Russia and China will be feeling pretty happy about it. Now, of course, the David that Gavin Barwell is referring to is, of course, Lord David Frost, who is the Brexit minister. Um, yes, ennobled in uh, yeah. as a reward for negotiating the deal yeah. that he's now trying to disown. Yes. Holy moly. Um, I, I, I know it's probably only you and me that follow it, but uh, Cummings has now uh, claimed that there was nobody thought there would ever be a deal with America. I do wonder if you voted for it and if you've got politicians, whether it's Jacob Rees-Mogg or, or Brexit hardman Steve Baker or journalists, and there's too many to list. You, you've got your favourites who you listened to and who persuaded you to vote for this. Now you've got Dominic Cummings saying nobody actually with an important role, including the Prime Minister, thought that there would be a US deal. It's incredible, isn't including it? Including the Prime Minister, because the yeah. Prime Minister, of course... Can, Said there would. Yes, and, and he criticised Barack Obama's part, uh, Kenyan heritage mm. as, being, as being responsible for anti-British rhetoric. And anti -British just before... Rhetoric. Just before Barack Obama then turned up in 2016 and stood alongside David Cameron and said we'd be at the back of the queue for um, uh, for a trade deal with the United States. 
But that was, of course, a, that from the Leave argument's point of view, was that one of the arguments being put forward was that you could do a free trade deal with the United States that you couldn't do whilst... And can now come into saying that was so much cant as well. They never thought that that would... Uh, no one honestly believed that that was ever going to happen either. So what, what, what was the... I mean, I cried. Well, it, it, of course, always depended on the administration in the White House as to whether a deal could be done with the United no, States. No, it's not. Cummings, sorry, I'm, I'm well, ambushing I mean, I'm, you with this. Cummings yeah. is saying that Trump was never going to do a deal either. There was never okay. any prospect of a deal with Trump. I mean, Cummings claims that he knew everything. He just forgot to tell us. It's like he's got a, uh, an absolutely masterful understanding of absolutely everything that's going on, but she goes to a different school. And now he's all over Twitter, essentially vomiting up his bitterness and his bile and throwing everybody under a bus, which still has a massive lie plastered on the side of it. I know what you're thinking, Theo. What's that? You're thinking, when I did that Rabbi Burns quote earlier, I did a sort of slightly unduly anglicised version of it, rather than going Sorry. all in on trying to do the, the full Scottish, didn't I? Go on. Okay. <clears> or <throat> what some poor the gift they gives, they see ourselves as others see us. So Give us the gift break. to see ourselves or as some, others see us. Or, or what some power the gift they gives to see ourselves as others see us. I'm stuck on the first bit. I think we should probably take a break. It is uh, a lot of love for the, for the late great Sid Waddell coming through. If you're just tuning in, you'll have to listen to the podcast to work out why. He cried salt tears. Uh, there were no more lands to conquer. Uh, 11.49 is the time. No, me neither. Uh, all right, here you go. Uh, it, it falls upon me today to knit together the strands of conversation that you have shared with me so far. Astonishing contributions from people with a proper understanding of the island, of Ireland. Um, some, uh, one of which we had, had arranged in advance, but um, that was uh, Tony Connolly, the... Uh, uh, you're a editor at RTE, the Irish state broadcaster. I didn't know that that, that Joe Berry, who who lost her dad in the Brighton bomb, is murdered by the IRA, was going to ring in, or, or that Dennis Loretto, one of the founders of the Alliance Party, was going to ring in today, or that or that John Laverty, the executive editor of the Belfast Telegraph, would be listening and and, and drop me a note on the subject as well. It just gives you an idea of uh, I, I, I hesitate to say it, but I will do how rare it is to have reality properly reported in the British media at the moment on, on these kind of issues. And I'm going to share with you now something which I think knits together a lot of what we've discussed today. And it involves me breaking the habit of a lifetime and actually playing you something that comes from one of those so-called think tanks that are mired in opaque and mysterious funding. That There are three people involved in what you're about to hear and I want you to pay attention in order. One of them is a chap called Martin McTague, who I think could be fairly described as knowing what he's talking about. He's from the Federation for Small Business. The next, is, and it's from the Policy Exchange, uh, quotes, think tank, end, end quotes, an event they held a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the second voice you'll hear belongs to one of their um, uh Herbert's in residence, a chap called Gerard Lyons, who was arguing in January of 2017 that the British economy would thrive trading under World Trade Organization tariffs. He, he wrote that alongside someone called Liam Halligan, who also describes himself as an economist, but I think is now applying his trade at GBB's. Um, everyone's got bills to pay. Don't be rude. And the final voice you'll hear is Lord Frost's. And you will have heard suggestions today from our callers in Northern Ireland that everything was going rather well there with regard to the protocol. What you won't have heard, or, or, or the dots you may not have joined, would be the... Uh, actually, I think Nolig made this point, actually. So you have heard this, but it might have been a little bit hard to swallow at the time. It's going so well for Northern Ireland that they have to spoil it because otherwise the comparisons between Belfast and Birmingham will become impossible to ignore. So have a listen to this from, from those three people. The fellow that knows what he's talking about from the Federation of Small Business, followed by the fellow that thought we'd be thriving under World Trade Organization tariffs and I think draws a salary from the policy exchange. His name is Gerard Lyons. Um, and then the other fellow, Lord Frost, on the end. This is quite remarkable, actually. Have a little listen. What would worry me is that you get a sort of two-speed... Uh, UK, where different things are going to happen in Northern Ireland to the rest of GB. And uh, I think that will put pressure on the union. 
inevitably, because I, talking to my members in Northern Ireland, they are increasingly trading north-south, yeah. uh, and that will weaken the links with GB. Uh, I think that's inevitable. Yeah, well, the key, regardless of your politics in economics, the important thing is that incentives do work. And if you start to have a new system that incentivizes business to behave in a different way, then business will respond to those incentives. And if you're saying, in the, Martin's saying this incentives is to go, should we say, north-south, as opposed to Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK, then eventually, if you leave that in place, that will have an impact on the economy. Um, and just to add on, on one of those points, the trade diversion point, I mean, it definitely is happening. We're definitely seeing uh, supply chains being reordered quite quickly. Trade between uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland has gone this is up frost. a lot in, in both directions. That's, that's clear from our figures and from, from Irish figures. Uh, people do respond very quickly. Businesses do respond very quickly to incentives. And, and incidentally, the other area where you see this is trade movements from Ireland across GB into the rest of the EU, where the land bridge, so-called, has kind of collapsed in the first nine months of this year. People have responded very quickly uh, to that incentive. So that's one reason why we can't wait very long to solve oh, this, this problem. Things are happening, and it isn't just theoretical. I'm going to play it again. Pay attention, because at the end of that, Lord Frost says the reason why we have to hurry up and do this thing that he's trying to do today is essentially, unless you're hearing it differently, in which case you know what to do, it's all, it's all going too well for the island of Ireland. The, the protocol is going too well for the island of Ireland, both halves, both bits, the big bit and the little bit, the north and the south. Listen to this again. Bloke from the Federation of Small Business, some Herbert called Lions, and then Frost. This is incredible. Why are you doing this mad thing that we've been trying to work out all morning? Answer, as our callers told us, and I should have paid more attention. It's because it's all going grand for us, James. And kudos to me for getting through nearly two hours of broadcasting, talking largely about Ireland without using the word grand until this point. Have another listen and listen to Frost, particularly at the end. OK, here we go. What would worry me is that you get a sort of two-speed... Uh, UK, where different things are going to happen in Northern Ireland to the rest of GB. And uh, I think that will put pressure on the union, inevitably, because I, talking to my members in Northern Ireland, they are increasingly trading north-south, yeah. uh, and that will weaken the links with GB. Uh, I think that's inevitable. Yeah, well, the key, th regardless of your politics in economics, the important thing is that incentives do work. And if you start to have a new system that incentivizes business to behave in a different way, then business will respond to those incentives. And if you're saying in the, Martin's saying this incentives is to go, should we say, north-south, as opposed to Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK, then eventually, if you leave that in place, that will have an impact on the economy. Um, just to add on, on one of those points, the trade diversion point, I mean, it definitely is happening. We're definitely seeing uh, supply chains being reordered quite quickly. Trade between uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland has gone up a lot in, in both directions. That's, that's clear from our figures and from, from Irish figures. Uh, people do respond very quickly. Businesses do respond very quickly to incentives. And, and incidentally, the other area where you see this is trade movements from Ireland across GB into the rest of the EU, where the land bridge, so-called, has kind of collapsed in the first nine months of this year. People have responded very quickly uh, to that incentive. So that's one reason why we can't wait very long to solve this, this problem. Things are happening, and it isn't just theoretical. So, so the problem, as described, is the fact that Ireland and Northern Ireland are flourishing under the terms of the protocol. That's the problem he's trying to solve. It's going too well for Northern Ireland and Ireland. That's incredible. It's not often I'm lost for words. And I'm not lost for words now, obviously, because, you know, uh, the, the emergency tape will kick in. It'll be Steve Allen talking about Christmas trees. But, the, 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 but that's quite remarkable. Um, and we go back to Belfast, where it'll probably be the last word on this. What's going on, Eamon? Uh, not much, James. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Things that was, that was mad, though, right? I couldn't believe my yeah. ears. Well, I got an inkling of it, James, when the protocol was first announced. The, yeah. the CEO of the Industrial Development Board in Northern Ireland uh, released a statement saying he couldn't believe how many, you know, US sort of foreign companies were were 
inquiring about Northern Ireland, how the protocol was work, going to work, how they could maybe, you know, have access to the European market and the British market at the same time. And it was all going to be great. And then all of a sudden it stopped. And then I realised that he was, you know, his, uh, his department was controlled by a DUP minister. Yeah. And, but I've lost the phone, and I've lost the phone line. You got your main point across, but I'm going to squeeze in one more before we move on at, at, at 12 noon. We'll talk again, but it was just the phone line lost us there. Ian's in Coates in Gloucestershire. Ian, what would you like to say? Yeah, uh, hi. I'll, I haven't called before. Hello. Welcome um, aboard. Better late than never. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I'd phoned earlier before uh, before you put on the bit about Mr. Frost. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, I, 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 it is exactly that. He is deliberately trying wow. to make it difficult um, <laughs> for the people in Northern Ireland. So it has to be as difficult for the people in Coates and Sinister and Birmingham and everywhere else in the UK because they can't allow it to, uh, Northern Ireland to flourish beyond the rest of the UK because it will expose the idiocy of Brexit. For want of a better word. Well, and it makes it... Well, I, I, I can't see any other alternative. Phone lines have been open for two hours. I didn't think we'd find that clip to sum it up quite so concisely and so neatly. But why are you doing this, Lord Frost? Because if we don't, Northern Ireland is going to be a shining beacon of the benefits of customs union ben- membership while still nominally being part of the UK. That's the only answer we've got, isn't it? Yeah. And well, it's tragic. You can say that again. Uh, Ian, thank you, mate. You brought me in bang on time as well. That's an astonishing achievement for a debutant. I've been doing this for nearly 20 years, and I get the timings wrong almost every every 15 minutes, but not today. No. Bang on the money. What are we going to do next? Do you want to talk about shortages in, in every sector in the country, pretty much? Or would you like to talk about Paul McCartney and the Rolling Stones? You can tell by my voice which one I prefer. Three minutes after 12 is the time. I'm not addressing the uh, uh, issue of whether or not Rabbi Burns would have appreciated his poetry being delivered in what many of you took to be a Geordie accent. I I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, I think at that time, no, I'm not going there. I'm just going to give a little nod towards the last two hours of programming, which were pretty special, actually. I think um, very little to do with me, if anything. Uh, Everything to do with the contributors. Because Joe's got back in touch on on Twitter, Joe Berry, um, who marked yesterday, of course, the anniversary of her father's murder by the IRA. Her father was killed in the Brighton bombings, you remember. And she's just messaged to say that the first person who thanked me after being on your program was the ex-combatant who killed my dad. We have become friends. The Good Friday Agreement has allowed this to happen. We need to heal the damage caused by Brexit by deep listening message there perhaps for me as well actually on, on, on things I could do a little bit better but my goodness me that stops you in your tracks doesn't it? It did me Four minutes after 12 is the time and I, I think, listen the shortages aren't going anywhere um, <laughs> whereas the Rolling Stones might be. We shall I, I just what I love about this story is look, two things okay, what I love about this story is it, it, it's got an emperor's new clothes flavor to it for me it's it's one of those things that you've always felt a little bit embarrassed to say out loud because you thought maybe the rest of the world could see something that you couldn't see the second bit it's got and i noticed this happening and i hope you've noticed as well i know that some of you have because you, you you've told me um particularly when i've been doing book 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 events the not that long ago i'd have gone a bit i'd have gone a bit mad now i'd have been very rude about the rolling stones and it would have been a little bit performative and a little bit over the top and a little bit inauthentic okay and that is not right and it's not fair right? you, you know it, it's odd to do this job and not sort of pretend to be more opinionated than you actually are it's it's you know whatever it is that you're talking about whether it's i don't know catherine wheels or lorry drivers uh, the the temptation to pretend to be a lot more enraged than you really are is is historically a big part of the job um but i don't do it anymore I, i i almost go in the opposite direction i try and calm myself down when i feel my anger rising or when i feel myself getting a little bit a little bit show-offy. So I'm not going to go in and be really, really rude about the Rolling Stones for, for two reasons. Number one, I wouldn't really mean it. I'll tell you exactly what my authentic and sincere thoughts are in a minute. And number two, well, actually, number three, my mother-in-law would kill me. But number two is that I, I, I don't have strong views. And I don't think Paul McCartney does either. Okay. 
because Paul McCartney has said something that I have always thought to be the case, but I always thought that there was something wrong with me for thinking this. And Paul McCartney is a musician of sufficient calibre for me now to conclude with some relief that there's nothing wrong with me, there's something wrong with the Rolling Stones. Because what Paul McCartney has said is this. I won't do the accent, not after the, uh, not after the Rabbi Burns debacle of a few moments ago. And he said it in an interview with the, with the New Yorker, so we don't have a recording of it. Paul McCartney said, I'm not sure I should say it, but they are a blues cover band. I'm talking about an act widely regarded perhaps as, as being in the top two of all time. The Beatles obviously being the other one. I'm not sure, don't Led Zeppelin me or anything like that. I'm just giving you the, giving you the, you know, the, 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 the consensus. I'm not sure I should say it, but they're a blues cover band. That's sort of what the Stones are. I think our net was cast a bit wider than theirs. And he's just right, isn't he? And it's no diss or cuss or particular uh, condemnation of the Rolling Stones, but to hear Paul McCartney say that, I don't know what is your Achilles heel where you just don't get it. Some people don't find Monty Python funny. That must be weird. It's quite an admission to make. You know, the rest of the world is laughing their little socks off. Some people might be pretending, perhaps, or going along with the flow. But they're, they're, you just look at a massive popular culture phenomenon and you just don't get it. And for me, the Rolling Stones have always been in that category. So, uh, a bit of a departure with normal programming for this hour. Is Paul McCartney right? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Are the Rolling Stones just essentially a blues cover band? Mick Jagger, leading singer of said popular beat combo, has responded, and he's responded a little bit like you see sometimes. I mean, Jagger's seventy eight now, and you do sometimes see people on social media trying a little bit too hard to prove that they're not a little bit rattled. And one way of doing this, and I'm pretty sure I've done it myself, so, you know, save your tuppence, pointing it out, we all try to be better. I'm pretty sure I've done it myself, although, I don't actually have I, I don't really get... Anyway, it, you, you, that you, you say sweetie or sweetheart or something. Oh, I do, I, I say champ sometimes. Oh, no, that's not when I'm rattled, that's when I'm trying to upset someone else. So I probably say sweetheart, and you, you're sort of trying to, you're trying a little bit too hard to prove that you don't care. There you go. That's it. Not you're not rattled necessarily, but you say, "Oh, sweetheart," or something like that. Oh, he's such a darling. You're trying a little bit too hard to prove that you don't care. So Mick Jagger has responded about ten days later by saying, "That's so funny. He's a sweetheart." Talking about, I think we could all agree, fifty percent of the finest songwriting duo of all time. Yeah. Well, don't Simon and Garfunkel because that was mostly just Simon. So. That's so funny, says Mick Jagger. He's a sweetheart. There's obviously no competition. One band is unbelievably, luckily, still playing in stadiums, and then the other band doesn't exist. So Paul McCartney accuses the Rolling Stones of being a blues cover band, and Mick Jagger responds by sort of trying to claim that the Rolling Stone Stones are bigger and better than the Beatles. And I want to know what you think. 03456060973 is the number that you need. Hit the only men find Monty Python funny. Same with the goons, says Michelle in Yorkshire. I haven't looked at that, but on this one, Polly says, McCartney is absolutely right. I've been saying it for years. It's the same with Blur and Oasis. Oasis were more like Quo than the Beatles, and Blur were more experimental and interesting. You lost me there, Polly, actually. I, 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 I like both of those bands, and I think Oasis get better with age, oddly. Um, whereas Blur perhaps get a little bit more, uh, a little bit harder to, to a, bit, a bit more impenetrable. But anyway, we digress. Here it is: oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Paul McCartney says that the Rolling Stones are just a blues cover band, um, and I think he's right. The best blues cover band of all time, a brilliant blues cover band, a blues cover band with a supremely charismatic and uh, and 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 flexible lead singer but basically a blues cover band. There are no Rolling Stones songs that dwell in your soul in the way that Beatles songs do. The, the, the poetry of Lennon and McCartney is something that Jagger and Richards wouldn't even dream of claiming to aspire to. They do completely different things, but in this particular clash, in this frank exchange of views, Paul McCartney's just right, isn't he? And Mick Jagger's not wrong. 
I mean, they are playing in stadiums, and it is incredible. But they're playing blues covers in stadiums, and that is the bottom line. Brilliantly playing them. Superb, supreme, but utterly derivative and completely... Uh, I don't want to go any further. I said I wouldn't. 12-12 is the time. David's in Victoria. Paul McCartney. Finally, David. Someone tells it like it is. I think it's a fatuous argument, personally. The Beatles were basically a studio band, and they were, they were great songwriters, but they haven't existed since 1970. They live forever so, in our hearts, David. Yes, they wrote some great songs. I'm not denying it. But to compare them, it's just silly. They're completely different bands. Did, no, I mean, you're one taking a it live band rather seriously. One one, is, yes, one, one is a live band that is essentially a blues cover band. No, they're not covering any blues. They're, they're, they've got a lot of original songs. Satisfaction is a cover of what? No, it's, it's a What's derivative. This is not my words. These are Paul McCartney's words. I don't care what Paul McCartney says. They're, what? The Beatles don't you can't exist. Say, you can't say that. You, can't, you have to care what Paul McCartney says. <laughs> he's just the godfather of rock and roll. Not. No, he's not. John Lennon might have been, but not Paul McCartney. I bet John Lennon would have agreed. Possibly might have done, yes. But um, as musicians, I'd rather see the Stones any day because they're a much more exciting band. Well, uh, yeah, no one's they disputing that. They, like. they can cover what they like. They can cover what they like. So, so this is bands. true. So they're both right. They're both right and they're both wrong. I don't know what the Stones have said about this, but as far as Paul McCartney... I'll tell you what they said. They said, he, they said, that's so funny, he's a sweetheart, there's obviously no competition, one band is unbelievably luckily still playing in stadiums, and then the other band doesn't exist. That's just a joke, isn't it? That's what the whole Jagger thing. said. I know, but that's just a joke. He's just being, he's being equally fatuous. <laughs> I mean, it's a silly argument. If you ask, if you had Paul McCartney in the studio now... Mate, it's 12.13. You can't call it a silly argument. I've got, to, I've got to string this out till one o'clock now I've made my decision. Exactly. You're just making, you're just making fodder for your radio show. It's just How stupid. dare you? How do I can't believe you fell into the trap. <laughs> Look, the whole thing is... What does that say about you, nonsense. clever clogs? <laughs> it's ridiculous. They're the best of friends, and that McCartney's promoting something, isn't he? He's uh, got something new on the go, and he's promoting it. I don't he's believe that. Wears any? Uh, well, he may have a solo. He, he may have a solo album on the. Uh, uh, he's, uh, actually, I think he's got a, 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 an album of collaborations out at the moment. I heard the one he did with Beck. David, I, 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 I take on board what you say. I, I'm not sure that the first caller should have been taking things quite as seriously as that, but I do uh, r register your objections. However, the fact remains that they are. I agree. They're a brilliant live band, it, but they're a bit like a trip. I tell you what, David, come back a minute. Don't say the word fatuous again, because it, 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 it upsets well, it me. No, stop it. Here you go. Right. The, the Rolling Stones are essentially their own cover band. Now they've become a little bit of a joke. There yes, we go. Finally, finally, they, finally they we find they, some common ground. They, they, I'm moving on because of the time, but I, there, there it is. So there, there, there we are. 03456060973. It's all about to go off on LBC, says Wayne. I don't think James knows what he's doing. I think you'll find I do. 12.17 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And listen, I'm having a bit of fun, uh, it, it, inevitably. It, 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 it is, however, I, I mean, a timeless conversation, the Stones-Beatles conversations. Some of my age, 